All right, so this is a run through of paper four, the theory extended option for biology for IGCSE, Cambridge International Examinations, so CIE. And this is May, June 2018, and paper 0610 slash 41. All right, let's begin. Excellent. Shall we start then? Bring it. Question 1A. The reactions of chemical digestion are catalyzed by enzymes. Figure 1.1 shows the stages of an enzyme catalyzed reaction. And state the names of objects A to D in figure 1.1. All right, A, that is the substrate. B is called the active site. Okay, do not label B as the enzyme because it's already been labeled as an enzyme. Okay, it's the active site. And C, that's the enzyme and the substrate joined together and the reaction's happening. That is called the enzyme substrate complex. Okay, obviously I'm just writing these up here so you can see them. Um, this is not where they want the answers. And finally, D, that's the products. That's what happens, that's what you get at the end. Sometimes the substrate is one thing going into two, sometimes it's two things going into one. All right, good, now we can write that in. Okay, A was the substrate, B was the active site, C was the enzymes, enzyme substrate clump complex, and D were the products. Okay, B, explain the importance of chemical digestion. Obviously, obviously mechanical digestion is things like teeth chomping away food and just churning of the stomach. Chemical digestion, that's a chemical process really. So the, the importance of that is that you produce smaller, more soluble molecules. So you produce smaller soluble molecules and the key word there is molecules, not particles or something else. These smaller molecules are then able to be absorbed through the cell membranes of, of the wall of the intestine and then they can go into the blood. And then once they're in the blood, they can go into the cells. Okay, you don't need all of those marks on, but let's get a couple marks in there. Okay, so the small molecules that can then be absorbed through the intestine wall into the blood. All right, good. C, figure 1.2 shows the human alimentary canal and associated organs. The function of some of these parts of the body are given in table 1.1. Okay, where's table 1.1? Okay, this is table 1.1 and it says complete table 1.1 and one row has been done for you. Okay, so we need to find, we have the function in the first column and we need to figure out which letter it is and what is the name of that structure. All right, so where is the site of starch digestion? Now, if you notice that that says digestion, not production, they're different. Okay, so starch is digested in a few areas. It can either be here, here, or here. J and E, those are parts of the small intestine. So those are both parts of the small intestine. And this is the mouth. Now, first of all, starch is digested in the mouth mouth is not digested in the salivary glands. That's where it where the amylase is produced. So you have to be careful about that. That's where you read the question. Now, do you put down A, J, and E? No. And the reason why is because if you notice here, it says the letter. It doesn't say the letters. It says the letter, which means I only want one. Okay? If you put down two or three, they will only mark the first one. And they, you run a risk of if one of them's wrong, they might, uh, they might say the whole thing's wrong. So only put down one letter. Okay, so definitely, starch is definitely digested in the mouth. So I'm gonna say A, and that's in the mouth. Okay, 
reabsorption of water. Well, that happens in the colon. Okay, and that's the large intestine. You could, you could say colon, you could say large intestine. Okay, the colon is H. There are some other sites where there might be reabsorption of water, but that's pretty much the most important one. All right, so H. Okay, secretion of pepsin. Okay, so pepsin is a type of protease that is secreted by the stomach. Okay, so that is C. So C, and that's the stomach. So the site of maltose digestion. Okay, maltose is digested in the small intestine, so either J or E, using the enzymes that were secreted by the pancreas. Right there. Okay, so that's the small intestine. So I'm going to say... E, small intestine, okay, secretion of bile. For the secretion of bile, you could say it's K in the liver or L in the gallbladder. Well, I'd say L, it's probably a little bit more specific because the gallbladder stores the bile. So L, gallbladder. Okay, storage of feces is already F in the rectum, and secretion of lipase and trypsin. Okay, the lipase and trypsin are enzymes that are secreted by the pancreas. Okay, that is D. Okay, as it already says, F is for the rectum. So that one's already been put in for you. Okay, so it's D for the pancreas. Okay, good. Question 2a. Adaptive features are defined as the inherited features of an organism that increase its fitness. State what is meant by fitness in this context. So fitness does not have anything to do with being healthy and exercising and eating the right foods. Okay, fitness, ad adaptive features that are inherited by an organism, that is all to do with the probability that an organism will survive and reproduce. Okay, the probability that an organism will survive and reproduce. And the key, key thing that a lot of students miss out is the and reproduce. Because it does no good for the species if the organism survives and just lives out its life happily. It needs to reproduce for the species to continue. So that's what is meant by the term fitness in this context. B. Rodents are the most common mammals in ho many hot deserts. Figure 2.1 shows the lesser Egyptian gerboa, Jaculus jaculus, which lives in North Africa and the Middle East in areas that have high daytime temperatures and very little rainfall. All right, what an interesting little rodent. Like many desert living mammals, gerboas are active at night. Suggest two features of J. jaculus that adapt it to each of the following challenges of living in desert ecosystems. Okay, the first one is very high daytime temperatures, and the second one is very little or no light at night. All right, there's many things you could put down for this, um, but you, you should only ever put down the number it tells you to. It says two features each, so don't put any more than that. Okay, so there's many things that you can put down for this, as we said. However, there's a few things that are more obvious than others. First of all, it's a light color, and it says it comes out mostly at night. However, if it does come out during the day, you don't want it black or something like that that's going to absorb black or brown that's going to absorb all the heat. You want it as light as you can. If you notice, it also has a very long, thin tail with very little fur on it. There's very little fur on the legs or on the feet. Um, so that's obviously not going to do much for insulation. We, we want it to lose as much heat as, as it can. It also doesn't have much fat on its legs or feet. The ears are very big, and that's, that allows them to lose heat through their ears. Okay. And there's a lot of other things that, that you could 
answer. Some of them are more behavioral, okay? So you could say that they remain in a burrow or stay in the shade during the day. They sleep during the day, and so they're inactive. You could say that they have a large surface area to volume ratio, that's not behavioral. And you could say that they produce very little or concentrated urine. You don't really know that they produce very little or concentrated urine though, so I would stay away from that. Okay. So I would say that they have very little fur and the fur that they have is light color. Okay, but only put down two points. Okay, you can put down any of those other ones. Okay. Okay, so if you look at this, how are they adapted to living at night in the dark? Well, the biggest, most obvious one I would say is that they have very big dark eyes. So large pupils. They have long whiskers so that they can feel uh, what's around them. That's the purpose of a whisker. Um, and they have large ears, again, so that they can hear what's coming rather than see. Okay, other things you can put down although you don't know if they're actually true, so I would probably stay away from them. Um, saying that there's lots of rods in the retina, because rods are good for black and white, for seeing at night, um, or that they have a good sense of smell. They do, but you don't really know that, so I would probably stay away from that. Okay, so I would put down that they have big eyes and they have long whiskers, okay? And while there's some other things that could get you the marks in this case, I would stay away from them if I don't know for sure that they're true. Just suspecting it might not be a good idea. C. A scientist studied communities in different parts of a desert and estimated the biomass of the organisms in each area. He divided the organisms into four groups according to their roles in the food web as shown in Table 2.1, which is right here. Detritivores are animals that eat dead organisms or parts of organisms. Okay. Some of these results are shown as a pyramid of biomass in figure 2.2. Okay, so we have the producers down at the bottom in our pyramid of bio biomass. And then we have fewer, a little bit less biomass in the herbivores and detritivores. One, use the information in table 2.1 to complete the pyramid of biomass in figure 2.2. So the first thing you should notice with this is that producers are, are this first bar and the second bar, bar is herbivores and detritivores. It's both of these. So that means you only need to add in one bar. Okay. So looking at the scale, you'll notice that these large squares are divided into five. Okay. So um, there's a, this is not a complete square and this is not a complete square. Okay, producers, there's 480 of them. So if we go, that's 50, 100, 150, 200, 250, 300, 450, 500, and there's 40 over here, and there's 40 over here. So each, each small square is worth 10. Okay, so the next thing you want to look at is where is the middle of this? Okay, so the middle is right here. Okay, that is the middle. You don't draw it on the, on the graph. Just make sure you, you notice where it is. Just to double check. That one, two, three, four, and a bit. One, two, three, four, and a bit. Okay, so this is the middle. So you want to center it around here. So each one of these squares is 10. Each one of these little squares is 10. Okay, so it's not a very big square you're drawing. Okay, so we have Okay, you want to make it the same height. So that's not perfect. That's not right. There we go. Okay, so if you look at this, there is one, two on that side, one, two. That adds up to 40. Okay, so this is labeled, should be labeled carnivores. Okay, 
Now you want to make sure that it's the same height as these other ones and you want to make sure that you put it the right width and you want to make sure that it's centered. Okay. The other thing it asks you to do is label it. So make sure you label it. All right. Good. Two. The scientist observed the detritivores and decided to include them with, this, with herbivores in this pyramid of biomass. Suggest what the scientist discovered about the detritivores that made him make this decision. Okay, so herbivores eat pretty much plants and producers. That's what, that's what herbivores eat. So if detritivores are going to be included in that, they probably eat mainly plants or mainly producers. Okay. It could also be that they feed at the same trophic level, so they're still primary consumers. Okay, well, which is the same as eating mainly plants. Okay, you could even say that they're that they feed at the th uh, that they're eaten by the third trophic level, which means that they are eaten by the secondary consumers. That is the same. Okay, so choose one of those. It doesn't matter which one. Okay, so I chose the detritivor the the detritivores eat mainly producers. But as I said, that you could say that they are primary consumers or that they're eaten by secondary consumers. Good. Three, explain why there are rarely more than four or five trophic levels in ecosystems. And there's not. Though you don't get six, seven, eight, nine, ten trophic levels. It's really maximum four or five. And the answer is energy. Okay. There is little energy transferred between trophic levels because a lot of the energy has been lost in so many different uh, processes, respiration, um, maybe not all the animals eaten. Uh, there's lots of different ways that the energy is lost in between trophic levels. So little energy is transferred between trophic levels. And also not all the organisms are, not all the organisms are eaten by the next trophic level. Some of them just die due to natural causes and then just decompose. And then that energy is not going to the next trophic level. Okay, so it's all about energy. Four, explain the advantages of presenting information about food webs as a pyramid of biomass and not as a pyramid of numbers. Okay, so when you're talking about a pyra pyramid of numbers, it doesn't necessarily add up. Okay, in a, in a pyramid of numbers, one large individual is shown as in the same way as one very tiny individual. So you can have one whale is shown the same as one small shark. Okay, they might be at a similar level of, of trophic level, a killer whale compared to a small shark, both predators, but they have a very different energy requirement. Okay, in a pyramid of numbers, one large individual is shown in the same way as one very tiny individual. Another example of this is a tree. Okay, one tree counts as one producer. And that's shown in the same way as one blade of grass. Obviously, if you're looking at blades of grass or individual small plants, you can have thousands making up the same biomass as one tree. So the key thing really, when you're talking about uh, food webs and pyramids and, and that sort of thing, is you want, you want to know the energy. So a pyramid of biomass indicates how much energy there is available, but a pyramid of numbers just says the number of organisms there are. It's not quite as useful. So biomass is an indicator of the energy available. Another thing you could write down, as there's three marks necessary, so you have to put down three things, is that a pyramid of biomass is always shaped like a pyramid. So large at the bottom and getting smaller and smaller. But a pyramid of numbers, you can have little tiny, then large, then medium, and then large again. That's not very much of a pyramid. Okay. Okay, so finally, a pyramid of biomass is shaped like a pyramid, whereas a pyramid of numbers is not always. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Okay, question three. Question three, a student cut a section of a root and made an outline drawing of the distribution of tissues as shown in figure 3.1. A1, 
Identify the position of the xylem tissue by drawing a label line and the letter X on figure 3.1. Okay, so the xylem in the root is this star shaped in the middle. Okay, so you draw a label line and then you say X. Okay, remember a line in biology does not have an arrowhead at the end and you have to draw it with a, with a ruler. Okay, they don't like it if you don't. A2, state why xylem is a tissue. Okay, so the definition of a tissue is that they're a group of cells with similar structures that are working together to perform a shared function. So a similar function. Okay, so they're a group of, they're composed of a group of cells with similar structures working together to perform shared functions. Okay, your two marks for, for that come from, first of all, one being a group of cells with similar functions, and secondly, that they work together to perform shared functions. Okay, next. B, water absorbed by the roots moves through the stem and enters the leaves. Most of this water is lost in transpiration. Explain how the internal structure of leaves results in the loss of large quantities of water in transpiration. Okay, they want you to explain and they want you to talk about the internal structure of the leaves. Okay? All right, so first of all, um, the water is supplied to the leaves by the xylem. When the water gets to the leaves, it, they, it evaporates from the surface of the meso mesophyll cells, the spongy mesophyll specifically. All right, it evaporates into the large air spaces. And because there's large air spaces, there's also a large internal surface area, so there's lots of evaporation. And then finally, the water is able to diffuse throughout through the stomata, which are controlled by the guard cells. Okay, so the full answer that I wrote is water is supplied to the leaves by the xylem, water evaporates from the surface of the mesophyll cells, then the large air spaces and large internal surface area in the leaves and water vapor diffuses through the stomata, which are controlled by the guard cells. Now this seems like a really long answer for a three mark question, and it is. There's too much information here. These are all points that will give you marks, but you can only get a maximum of three marks. So you only need to put down basically three of these points. I would, personally, I wouldn't use all these points. It's talking about the internal structure of the leaves. So I would probably probably talk about the mesophyll cells and the large air spaces and the large internal surface area because that's very much the internal structure of the leaves. However, all of those would give you marks. Question four. The flow of blood through the skin can be investigated by using a flow meter. Figure 4.1 shows a flow meter above a section through the skin. Okay, so we have the skin we have the flow meter. This is the, this is a flow meter that's measuring the flow of blood inside the skin. Okay, and as we move down, here's the section of the skin. Okay, we have some, we have a section here where it looks like blood flows up through these vessels and then along through here and then, then down and goes out through this vessel. We have another cell going up here with little sections that come off of it and then we have some another layer of cells here and a ring of muscles here. I would suspect they want you to label a bunch of these. All right and here we go. A1 state the name of cell P. Okay so cell P is this long thin cell here with these little bits that come off. This is known as a sensory neuron. It is meant to detect, to sense what's happening in the world outside. Specifically temperature is what these ones are looking for. So this is a sensory neuron. All right, it would also be acceptable to say temperature receptor or temperature receptor neuron temp or thermoreceptor, thermoreceptor neuron. Good. A2. State the types of blood vessel labeled Q, S, and T. All right, so we look at the, the diagram here. This here is an artery, and this here is a vein. As you can see, the vein is larger than the artery with less muscle, and here's more muscle. 
All right, and so the artery breaks off into a smaller artery type. And this is known as an arteriole. It's basically a small artery. It's very similar to an artery, just much smaller. And then going down into the vein, we have a small vein type, and that's called a venule. Okay, and connecting the artery, arteriole, and the venule, we have the capillary. Okay, good. So the answer was Q was a venule, S was an arteriole, and T was a capillary. All right, and A3. State the name of the tissue R that provides insulation. Okay, uh, tissue R is down here and it says it provides insulation, so this is fatty tissue. Or I could just say fat. Okay, that's a fatty tissue. It's the fatty tissue. All right, good. On to B. Okay, B. The blood flow through the skin of some volunteers was, me was measured with a flow meter when their skin was exposed to different temperatures. Capsicum is a compound that gives people the sensation of feeling hot when it is put on the skin. Researchers applied capsicum to the skin of, of the volunteers and again measured the blood flow through their skin at different temperatures. Figure 4.2 shows the results. Okay, so this is the graph that shows the results. Okay, without capsicum, when the temperature increased, then the blood flow increased as well at a nice consistent rate. Okay, obviously the reason why it increases is so that it can lose more heat and cool itself down. But if cap when capsicum was, was applied, uh, the blood flow increased more dramatically at each point. Okay, now let's look at the questions. One, use the information in figure 4.2 to describe the effect of increasing the temperature of the skin surface on blood flow to the skin without capsicum. Okay, so this question, it wants you to do a couple things. Whenever it says use the information in a graph, it means that they want you to actually quote some numbers. Okay, and you're describing the effects, you are not explaining them. You're just saying what happens. Okay, you're not saying why it happens. And you're describing the effects of increasing the temperature of the surface of the skin and blood flow to the skin without capsicum. So don't compare the two graphs. You're only looking at it without capsicum. So if we look at this graph, it looks like it stays constant. And it stays constant at about 4%, uh, percent, 4 to 5% of blood flow, maximum blood flow. And then it increases it cre increases at about temp uh, 25 degrees celsius okay and from 25 degrees celsius it increases to a maximum of 100 percent blood flow at 40 degrees celsius actually it's not 40 degrees celsius it's actually at 41 degrees celsius because if you look at this graph it quite often each one of these goes up by five but if you look at it carefully, it goes, you have 10, 10 squares to go five spaces. So each square is half a degree. Okay, so each two squares is a degree. So here we go up, and that's actually 41 degrees Celsius, not 40 degrees Celsius. And it's not 42 degrees Celsius either, it's 41 degrees Celsius. Okay, now let's put that information into the answer. Okay, so first of all, we can start by saying the blood flow remains constant at 4%, and then it increases. Okay, and it increases from 25 degrees Celsius. And it increases to a maximum, or 100%, at 41 degrees Celsius. Okay, so the blood flow remains constant at 4%, and then increases, and blood flow starts increasing at 25 degrees Celsius, and increases to a maximum of 100% at 41 degrees Celsius. Okay, it looks like you haven't used enough space here, but you have all the points you need and more. Okay, so remember when it says use the information, you can't just generally describe the curve. You have to actually use some data from the graph. It's very important. Okay, two, 
and explain the mechanism that increases blood flow through the skin. Okay, so the first thing that has to happen in order to increase the blood flow is you have to know, the skin has to know that it needs more blood. So first of all, the sensory neurons in the skin have to detect that there's a change in temperature, and, it ha and this signal has to go to the brain, or the hypothalamus, which is a control center. Okay, so the change in temperature is detected by sensory neurons in the skin, and the signal is sent to the hypothalamus in the brain as a control center. Well, specifically, this isn't actually talking about the change in temperature because the capsicum doesn't actually change the temperature, it just is detected. So you, if you didn't include change in temperature, that's okay. But you could say a stimulus is, is detected as well, and that would, be very, that would probably be even better. Okay, once the signal is sent to the brain, then an impulse is sent back through the motor neuron to the effector, which is a muscle, and those muscles are in shunt vessels, and they, the shunt vessels contract, and the arterioles relax, okay? That makes the arterioles dilate. This is called vasodilation, okay? And because of vasodilation, more blood flows to the capillaries, which is near the surface of the skin. All right, there's a lot of information in there. You don't need all of it. I'm not going to talk about the shunt vessels. They're important, but also we could just talk about the arterioles. Okay, so the change in temperature is detected by sensory neurons in the skin, and the signal is sent to the hypothalamus in the brain as the control center. It, impulse is sent through the motor neuron, and muscles in arterioles relax, so arterioles dilate, which is vasodilation. This increases blood flow into capillaries near the surface of the skin. Okay, I've put down more information than is necessary, just to make sure you have a clear idea of what's happening. Now, whenever you're answering a question like this, you need to look at the marks. There's only three marks available for this, so you don't want to spend 10 minutes answering this question. But sometimes you might look at something and say, so this increases blood flow to, into the capillaries, that, well, that should be one mark, near the surface of the skin, so that should be another mark. But really, those two things are part of the same mark. So sometimes you might want to put down three marks worth plus one or two extras if there's lots of information you can put down just to make sure you've covered everything and you aren't missing out on a mark even though you know the answer. Okay, but don't write too much. The other thing is, write in bullet points. That's okay. That's actually preferable. Okay? Uh, examiners don't want to really read long paragraphs and it makes it clearer to you how many points you've put down. Three, state the difference between the average blood flow for the treatments with and without capsicum at 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, and gives you space for working out. So to do that, we have to look at the graph at 35 degrees Celsius. Okay, so at 35 degrees Celsius, these are our, that's our line. Okay, for without capsicum, We're at 20% 20, 20 blood flow. And with capsicum, we're at 60, 68%. 68%. Okay? So we're at 20 to 68%. So now we can work, work that out in the space for the working. And this question didn't say to show clearly on the graph your construction lines, but A, it makes it easier for you to see, and B, sometimes they, keep, they want to mark for that anyway. It's not difficult for you to just draw a line just to make sure that you know what it is. Okay, so that you're nice and clear. Okay, so the difference equals the flow with, capsin, caps, with capsicum minus the without, which was 68% minus the without, which was 20%, which equals 48%. So the answer here is 48, and the percent's already in there, so you don't need to worry about the units. Okay. Okay, so the researchers thought that capsicum stimulated receptors in the skin. Explain the process by which capsicum capsicum could reach these receptors. It doesn't mean you know the answer, but there you, you can give a few possible explanations. Okay, so there's a couple things you could do. You could talk about either its diffusion or its active transport. 
or you could talk about both because this is a, a which it could. So you could say that it traveled by diffusion and if you're talking about diffusion, you have to say it's down a concentration gradient through the epidermis. Okay, the other thing you could talk about is you could say it's, it, it didn't diffuse because it's difficult for things to get through the epidermis, so it's through active transport. Okay, and again, that's through the epidermis or between cells or through cells across cell membranes. Okay, so there's a few, a couple different things you could go. I'm going to talk about diffusion. I actually think it probably isn't diffusion. It probably is active transport because it's difficult for things to get through the skin. But diffusion is a nice one that they love to ask questions about. Okay, so you can say it's diffusion down the concentration gradient through the epidermis across cell membranes. So whenever you use the word diffusion, you should almost always talk about the concentration gradient. Okay, unless you talk about water and then you say the water concentration gradient. You have to be very specific with that. Okay, and then that's kind of a free mark. Okay, the other thing you can write down instead, because that's this is definitely three marks. Diffusion down the concentration gradient and you can say through the epidermis and then across cell membranes. That's like three or four marks. Okay, but you could also talk about active transport. So you could also say active transport through the epidermis into cells across cell membranes. So that also works. Don't put down both. Just put down one. There's enough information there. I know that there's still a lot of space, but don't panic if you haven't used all the space as long as you know that you should have three marks worth. Okay? So either of those answers should be good, but don't put down both. Good. Okay, C. Explain the importance of regulating body temperature in humans. Now this is worth four marks, but there's lots and lots of answers you could put down. Okay. So one of the big things about regulating body temperatures, I would say probably the biggest things, because everything else is controlled by that, is that by keeping a constant body temperature, you maintain the optimum temperature for most of the enzymes that, that live in your body. And if you have the optimum temperature, then they don't denature, and things work at a, at a constant rate. All the reactions happen at a constant rate. So first of all, it maintains the optimum temperature for proteins and enzymes. So the enzymes do not denature because they're too hot. When it, and it also maintains constant rates of metabolism or reactions in the body. So if they're too hot, they denature. If it's too cold, then reactions go too slowly. You want things to go just right. It also avoids damage to cell membranes. If it's, if it's too cold, then the water inside cells crystallizes and damages the cell membranes. If it's too hot, then the cell membranes don't really stay together very well. Okay, so other things you could have put down there, you could say it helps you avoid heat stroke or hypothermia or dehydration or freezing and at high temperatures sperm production is, is, is reduced. Okay, so there's lots of things you could have put down. So only make sure you put down around four points. D, body temperature is controlled by both hormones and nerves. Explain how coordination by hormones differs from coordination by nerves. So hormones are chemicals, and these chemicals are transported by the blood through the circulatory system. Okay, hormones are chemicals transported through the circulatory system. Okay, if, when you compare hormones and nerves, the effects of, of hormones, they're slower to take effect, and they are longer lasting than nerves are. Okay, so the effects of hormones are slower to act, but are longer lasting than the effects of nerve impulses. All right, and finally, each hormone may have more than one target organ or tissue or cell. Okay, and nerves, it has one impulse goes to one effector. Okay, so each hormone may have more than one target organ. Okay, that's at least three, three marks there. So you're good. 5A, state the balanced chemical equation for aerobic respiration. Aerobic meaning it needs oxygen. Okay, so that's a chemical equation, not the, uh, not the word equation. So we have C6H12O6 plus 6O2 produces 6CO2 plus 6H2O. Because you have six carbons, you need six carbon dioxides, and then everything else all balances out. Okay. That's just one of those equations you really just should know backwards and forwards, inside and out. 
B. Researchers in the Czech Republic investigated oxygen consumption in horses. They measured the oxygen, oxygen consumption of the horses while they were exercising at four different paces, walking, trotting, cantering, and galloping. The results are shown in figure 5.1. So as you would probably guess, the faster the horse is going, the more oxygen the horse needed to use. All right. Calculate the percentage increase in the average rate of oxygen consumption as the horses change from walking to trotting and show your working. So if we look at this, the average rate of oxy oxygen consumption when the horses were walking, it was at 20. 20 centimeters cubed per kilogram per minute. Okay. The average rate when they were trotting was 50. Okay, so we can use that information in, in our calculation. So the average increase equals the difference between the two paces divided by the, the consumption when, when, it was, when the horse was walking. Okay, the difference equals 50 minus 20, and that is divided by 20. So the answer there is, oh, and you multiply it by 100% because it's the percentage increase. The answer, answer is 150%. And uh, the, the units are already in there. Okay, one mark for the working, one mark for the answer. Good. Okay, C. The researchers also calculated the oxygen debt for each type of exercise. They found that the horses developed a larger oxygen debt when they exercised by galloping and cantering rather than when they walked. Explain why the horses developed an oxygen, oxygen debt when they exercised. Okay, so the oxygen debt is basically they don't have enough oxygen. So why? Because the demand for the oxygen increased. So it increased because the rate of respiration increased because they were exercising. All right, so when they're exercising, they are not breathing enough to supply enough oxygen to the muscle. Okay, so the horse's breathing rate was not increasing enough to supply enough oxygen to the muscles. And because of that, the muscles had to respire anaerobically, and that produced lactic acid, and that's the oxygen debt. Okay, so the demand for oxygen increased because the rate of respiration increased. Horse's breathing rate was not increasing enough to supply enough oxygen, oxygen to the muscles, and muscles respire anaerobically, and lactic acid is produced. And that's why they have an oxygen net. D. Describe how the horses would recover from an oxygen debt when they stop exercising. Okay, when they stop exercising, they don't just go suddenly back to breathing how they normally did. They continue to breathe at a high rate and deeply. And they also have a very high pulse rate or heart rate. Okay. Okay, so the horses continue to breathe at a high rate and deeply, and the heart rate also continues to be high. What this does is it provides enough oxygen to pay off the oxygen debt. And that oxygen allows the lactic acid to move out of the muscles into the blood, and it's transported to the liver where it's broken down or oxidized aerobically. Okay, so horses continue to breathe at a high rate and deeply. The heart rate also continues to be high. This provides enough oxygen to pay off the oxygen debt. Lactic acid diffuses into the blood and lactic acid is transported to the liver and broken down by aerobic respiration. Okay, there's one, two, three, four, five points there. A couple of these points may have two, two marks in there. Some of them will have one. Uh, that's a good answer. Question 6a. Figure 6.1 is a diagram of the human female reproductive system. A1. Complete table 6.1 by stating the letter from 6.1 that identifies the structure where each process occurs. All right, so we have to figure out where, pro where the process of meiosis, fertilization, and implantation occur. So the first process we need to, to figure out is meiosis, and meiosis happens to create the eggs that are ready to be fertilized, and that happens in the ovaries. So this is meiosis. Meiosis is at R. 
Then the next one is fertilization, and fertilization happens in the oviduct, which is S. And it has to happen before it gets to the uterus, and implantation happens into the lining of the uterus called the endometrium. Okay, and that's V. All right, let's write that in. Okay, fertilization, uh, meiosis was at R, then fertilization was at S, and implantation was at V. All right, good. State the name of the part of the of the female reproductive system labeled S in figure 6.1. Okay, as we said, for the structure S is where fertilization take place and takes place, and that is the oviduct. That's the oviduct. B, figure 6.2 is a diagram of a human sperm cell. B1, write the formula that would be used to calculate the magnification of the diagram, okay? So magnification equals the image size over the actual size. Okay, image over actual. Good. I like to draw a triangle when I do this if I'm if I'm doing one of these diagrams, but this this question wants the full thing there. I say uh, magnification image actual, okay? And if you want to find the magnification, you cover over magnification, and that means image over actual. If you want to find the actual, it's image over magnification. And if you want to find the image, you, co you cover over that, and it's magnification times actual, okay? That's called the triangle method, but we're not, that's just as an aside. We're not going to go into that really. And the triangle method is just a, a technique that a lot of people use just to make certain equations easy to use, easy to re rearrange, and sometimes easier to remember. Two, the actual length of the sperm cell in figure 6.2 is 0 0.055 millimeters. Convert this value to micrometers. Okay, to, to, so to convert from millimeters to micrometers, you multiply that by 1,000. So 0 0.055 millimeters times 1,000 equals 55 micrometers. So the answer is 55. C. Explain why the nuclei of sperm cells differ from those of other cells in the male. Well, sperm cells are haploid, which means they have half the number of chromosomes of all the other cells in the body. Okay? They are also produced by meiosis. The purpose of this is so that when the sperm fertilizes the egg, the, num the, the number of chromosomes of the fertilized egg is back to the same number as all the other cells in the body. Okay, so the sperm cells are haploid, so have half the number of chromosomes compared to other cells, and sperm cells are produced by meiosis, whereas other cells are produced by mitosis. All right, next. D. Explain the roles of the flagellum, the mitochondria, and the acrosome in sperm cells. Okay, so first of all, the flagellum. Okay, the purpose of the flagellum is to propel the sperm towards the oviduct. Okay, so it can fertilize the egg. All right, so the flagellum propels sperm towards the oviduct in order to fertilize the egg. The mitochondria, okay, the mitochondria provides ATP so that the sperm has enough energy to make it all the way to the egg. Okay, the mitochondria supplies ATP so, so the sperm has enough energy for aerobic respiration so it can reach the egg. It's, there's a ton of mitochondria in the sperm because it's a long way for a little tiny sperm cell to, to travel. Okay, and finally the acrosome. It is a structure on the sperm that contains enzymes and these enzymes break down or digest the jelly coat around the egg. And the reason for that is so that the sperm nucleus can enter the egg cell so that they can fuse together. So the acrosome contains enzymes to digest the jelly coat so the sperm nucleus can enter the egg and fuse with the egg nucleus. All right, let's move on. E. Explain why the sex of a child is determined by its father. The mother is not able to produce any, to have any say in the sex of the child. Not that the father has a choice. 
Okay, and the reason why is because sex is determined by the X and Y chromosomes. Okay, so males are XY and females are XX. Females, the mother, can only donate an X. They cannot donate a Y. The father is the only one that can donate a Y. Okay, so the mother is only able to, to donate the X, the X portion. If, if the child is going to be a male, it has to get the Y from the father. So females can only provide X chromosome, chromosomes, whereas only males can provide the Y chromosome. Okay, that is the end of this paper. I hope you found it useful. If you did, please click the thumbs up button. So like and subscribe. And also, we, we love getting comments down below, so please ask questions or give us some feedback. And have a great day.